Members, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the First and Deputy First Minister, the Executive Office, and I call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one. Uh, as the member will be aware, no authority was conferred on the First Minister and myself by the Good Friday Agreement or the 1998 Act in relation to ruling on alleged breaches by other ministers or for imposing sanctions on them. The accountability of ministers for their conduct is ultimately to this Assembly. The fact that the Pledge of Office and the Ministerial Code of Conduct are included in the Ministerial Code did not qualify or replace the statutory arrangements put in place to determine alleged breaches of the pledge, which include questions of compliance with the Ministerial Code of Conduct. However, as with any issue, a member of the public may write to us where we receive such a complaint we would consider it in accordance with the mechanisms provided in the Act. These allow us, if we consider it justified, to table a motion to ask the Assembly to resolve that a Minister has not observed the terms of the Pledge of Office. If the Assembly so resolves, the sanctions available to it are censure, exclusion from office or a reduction of remuneration. That decision is, however, one for this Assembly. A member of the public may, of course, also approach an MLA to request them to consider tabling such a motion, which must have the support of 30 members. Mr. New for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. And, and I brought a, an amendment to this House previously, and it was disappointing that, that no one from the Executive Office was here to, to respond to that debate. Do, could I ask the Deputy First Minister why he thinks it's acceptable that whilst other members here in this House are open to an independent investigatory process that for ministers that they have a lower level of accountability, no direct access for members of the public to make complaints, and why he thinks that he and other ministers should be less accountable? Well, well I, I'm aware that in, in a recent debate in the Chamber, Mr Agnew called for the, there to be a standards commissioner to investigate alleged breaches of the Ministerial Code of Conduct. He alternatively suggested that the remit of the Assembly Commissioner of Standards be extended so that this office would have the power to adjudicate upon alleged breaches of the Ministerial Code. This would be in addition to the powers that it currently has to adjudicate upon alleged breaches of the Members' Code of Conduct. It is the Assembly which has defined the role of the Standards Commissioner to exclude Ministerial Conduct, even though it is the Assembly which must resolve that the Pledge of Office has been breached. Uh, and uh, while this would be a matter for the Assembly uh, to pursue, if members see fit to do so, we, we would be happy to discuss the need for any expansion of that role, particularly to avoid uh, nugatory expenditure on separate arrangements. So uh, it's a matter that we are willing to have a conversation about in the time ahead, and I would suggest that uh, people should take up that offer. Members, I must inform the House that question number 13 has been withdrawn. Call Ms. Palm Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I just ask, uh, or thank the, the Deputy First Minister for his answer so far, and ask if he um, believes the public are currently being fettered from raising concerns by the present arrangements? No, uh, as, as I outlined in, in my uh, initial answer, it's quite clear that there are several routes. Uh, that uh, can be accessed by both uh, members and by the public. Uh, and of course, one route is through the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. The other route is through approaching uh, a member of the Assembly who, uh, to, to put it before the Assembly, must uh, gather 30 signatures. So uh, I've listened very carefully to what uh, uh, Stephen Agnew has had to say, uh, and I would hope that the answer to that does allow for a conversation, not just between ourselves and Mr Agnew, but if any other member of the Assembly uh, feels they need to take up our offer to discuss this matter, we are more than willing to facilitate. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the Deputy First Minister, on the, the, the heels of the, his last answers, does he recognise that there is a wider problem in terms of ministerial conduct, in terms of openness and transparency, and that we have seen a decline in terms of standards during this mandate, in terms of things like responses to FOIs, numbers of ministerial statements uh, to, to the House, uh, delays in terms of responses to questions, and indeed non responses by ministers to very important ministerial debates, including today's debate on Brexit? Well, I, I think that obviously that's a, a whole range of uh, cr criticisms, uh, all of which may have merits or, or not. Uh, I do believe that the administration is open and transparent. Others will disagree. Others will disagree with that. But uh, you know, the, the the big change that happened, folks, was what happened to me when we had the election. Whenever there was an opportunity for five parties in this assembly to take up a ministerial position. Uh, three parties chose not to do that. Uh, the DEP and ourselves had the courage to go forward together. And of course, the criticisms that have been lodged in relation to the range of issues just specified by the member are, are all issues which we, on a consistent basis, are trying to ensure that we close the gap between us. So it's still early days, but some of the criticisms I accept. Some of the criticisms I don't accept. The criticisms that I accept, we will try to do something about. Call Mrs. Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Minister outline uh, what sanctions are in place where ministers are found to be in breach of their ministerial code? Well, I, I think I answered that question already in my first answer. Call Mr. Philip Smith. Question two, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Executive published an action plan on tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime in July 2016. When we published the action plan, we made clear our commitment to work with local communities and to build on the good work we know goes on already. We have established a cross-departmental programme board, which meets regularly and is developing a work programme for 2016-17. Work is also underway to develop detailed cost of programmes to be put in place from 2017 to 18 onwards. We meet regularly with the Justice Minister to review progress, and we also discuss progress at our fresh start meetings with both the British and the Irish governments. Call Mr. Smith for his supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Uh, following recent media revelations and allegations about organisations in receipt of major executive funding, what actions are you putting in place to ensure funding is not being given to those involved in criminality and paramilitarism? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that we have uh, very robust uh, processes in place, and uh, it's obvious that the member is talking about the recent publicity surrounding the situation in East Belfast with the Charter Group. Uh, and it's quite obvious from the steering committee on that group that it's made up of a number of politicians from this assembly, a number of people from statutory agencies, and a number of people from the business community. So we do have a very robust mechanism in place to ensure that all funds in relation to the SIF program is properly accounted for. We don't have any concerns about that at all. Well, Ms. Claire Hanna. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for his answers. Um, the Minister, Deputy First Minister has referred to media investigations around SIF and concerns about a recipient organisation. Uh, the Deputy First Minister will also be aware of the three-person uh, panel report on paramilitarism and the need not to bolster and empower paramilitary organisations. Could the Deputy First Minister outline whether or not he thinks the UDA are a current or former paramilitary organisation? Well, I mean, our, our responsibility is to deal with the steering groups that were established under the terms of the SIF programme. And the steering groups are the people who decide how any particular project is taken forward or projects taken forward in any individual area. I don't have any doubt whatsoever that the UDA is in existence. The question is what role people who were formerly members of the UDA are playing within our society. I think there are people who are still in the UDA who play a very negative role. There are people who were formerly in the UDA who play a very negative role. And there are people who were formerly in the UDA who play a very positive role. 
I would like to think that in our dealings with people, we are working with people within society who are playing a positive role. On the Republican side, there are many ex-prisoners who have been convicted of many things, all of whom make a very powerful and positive contribution to developing communities, their capacity, and just as importantly, working cross-community with uh, many individuals who previously would have been considered to be enemies. So we, we are a society in transition, and I know that it's the job of the opposition, if they get the opportunity, to score cheap political points. The, the, main, the, main, the main message here today is that there's a steering group in East Belfast made up of politicians from this House, statutory agencies, the business community, and others who would be deemed to be of the loyalist persuasion. The important thing for us is that every penny is spent properly, and thus far there has been no suggestion from anybody that anything other than that has been the case. Well, Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for the answers he's given the House up to this point. Can the Deputy First Minister provide an update to the House on the establishment of the Independent Reporting Commission on to the issue of paramilitary activity? And does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that it is an outrageous slur upon many of the good people who are involved in SIF projects to accuse them of being involved in paramilitarism? I have seen in my own constituency the positive benefit that these projects will have, as has the lady from South Belfast. She knows the positive benefit they will have, and it's wrong to slur those people in that way. Well, in, in relation to the Independent Reporting Commission, one of the commitments in a, a fresh start was that a four-member international body would be established by the British and the Irish governments, and that body will be responsible for reporting annually in progress towards ending continuing paramilitary activity and reporting on the implementation of measures of the three administrations. It will also consult with government and relevant agencies and groups. The British and Irish government signed the treaty required to provide for this body on Tuesday the 13th of September, and we understand that supporting regulations have been laid before the uh, British Parliament and that the Irish government will bring forward proposals for implementing legislation before the end of the year. The aim is to have the Commission in place by the end of this year, and of course we in the Executive will nominate two members to the body in due course. In relation to the work of the SIF programme, I, I think that the schemes that are being developed right across the North are of immense value to the local communities. It's not a top-down process, it's people at grassroots level deciding what they think is best uh, to meet the, the needs in their own communities. And at the very beginning of the process, whenever the SIF was uh, mooted and launched, uh, there were suggestions from people in one, at least one of the opposition parties that this would be a slush fund for paramilitaries. Well, it's quite clearly nothing of the sort. Yes, people have seized on the situation and on one person in East Belfast, but I think that does a grave disservice to the good and decent people right throughout the country who are working day and daily to ensure that the lives of the people that uh, or the community that they come from are enriched by delivering valuable programs so let's get away from the nonsense that uh, this is uh, directed at paramilitaries this is directed at communities and the communities are the people who are making the decisions and of course on the steering groups there is a wide range of rep uh, representation to ensure whatever safeguards are required, as well as the auditing processes that we as a government conduct on all of these programmes. Call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you. The, the Minister has said that the East Belfast SIF Advisory Panel includes members of the statutory services and representatives of the business community. And yet, the Executive Office website lists eight people, none of whom represent the business community or are members of the statutory services. Would the minister like to revisit his claim? Uh, I'd be prepared to send the member the names. I call Mr. Philip McGuigan. Uh, Karen Kohler, and can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answers and detail the work uh, of the Executive's Action Plan. And just following on from his answers, can I ask how he and the First Minister will ensure that the, the work of the Executive Action Plan uh, on these activities 
complements and brings added value to the work already going, ongoing at community level? Well, well I mean, as, as we all know, de dealing with uh, paramilitary activity, criminal activity of any description, and organised crime, requires a collaborative approach. And of course, the report of the three person panel specified that. And that, that has to be an approach that engages all the key public uh, stakeholders, uh, all working in partnership with uh, local communities. So community input is absolutely vital to the full implementation of the recommendations. And more importantly, that means delivery agencies listening to communities and understanding the impact that criminality has on community life. So innovation, co-design and community partnership working must define the implementation of the 43 recommendations. There's been a lot of criticism in the past that there was no plan to deal with this unacceptable situation that unfortunately still exists within our society. Well, this is a plan. This is a very serious attempt by this executive, supported by others, to ensure that we continue to bear down. And of course, a key role in all of that has to be played by the police service, who, who are enthusiastic about this, who are up to the task, and who absolutely believe that uh, they can only be effective if they're getting support in local communities. So I think, you know, rather than trying to uh, uh, chip away at this, the opposition would be much better employed in weighing in behind it and giving it the support and giving the police the support that they deserve. Call Ms. Paula Brown. Speaker, and can I ask the Deputy um, First Minister, in light of the First Minister's willingness to stand to be photographed beside self-admitted paramilitary figures, what credibility is now left in the Executive to its commitment to the disbandment of paramilitary groups? Thank you. Well, I, I don't have any doubt whatsoever about the First Minister's commitment to the disbandment of paramilitary organisations. Not, none whatsoever. I, and I don't think she has any doubt whatsoever about my commitment to stand against them because uh, anybody that's involved in a paramilitary organisation, criminal gang, are working against the interests of the people that we in this assembly uh, represent. And yes, there are people out there who are still uh, dedicated and committed to try to bring these institutions down and to plunge us back to the past. But I have to say, when, when I see the way, rather pathetically, uh, an attempt is made to try to portray what was happening in East Belfast as anything other than uh, putting in place work programs which were about giving employment opportunities to people who had previously been unemployed with a very real opportunity to go on to full-time employment. As far as I'm concerned, that's a valuable program. And if people are contributing to that in a positive way alongside all our representatives from the community, I think that's something to be welcomed. If, if we were to be employing a rule of thumb that everybody who was involved in conflict in the past has no role to play in the future, then I'm afraid there will be no future for any of us. Mr Nelson McCausland is not in his place. I call Mr Tom Buchanan. Number four, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Executive published uh, an action plan on tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime in July 2016, setting out the measures we will take to implement the panel's recommendations. Work is underway to take forward a number of measures this year and to develop detailed cost of programmes to be put in place from 2017-18 onwards. Call Mr Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his response. But can I advise the House, is he satisfied that enough is being done to rid our society of these paramilitary groups? Well, I, I think the fact that we dealt with this in the Fresh Start Agreement and that we came to an agreement as to how we need to move forward with the support of both the Irish and the British governments and, of course, the PSNA and the Gardaí, then it's quite clear at that stage that we accepted that more needed to be done. Uh, I've laid before the Assembly today uh, exactly what we're trying to do in terms of the plans that we've put in place, the establishment of a, 
uh, an IRC, uh, a four-person IRC. We will contribute two names to that. The Irish and the British governments will contribute two names. And that's a determined effort uh, by us as a government to work collaboratively with everybody within society who agrees with us that paramilitarism, criminality, criminal gangs are a scourge on our society. So we're absolutely determined to continue on with this work in, in the belief that ultimately the, those who uh, are in favour of uh, peaceful and democratic processes will prevail over those who, through their criminality, try to undermine the potential uh, of our society moving forward to deliver for themselves. Well, Mr. Danny Kennedy. Uh, can I ask the Deputy First Minister what thought has been given to sanctions for any group that fails to disband by the end of the lifetime of, of this strategy? Well, I think that all of these are matters that we will uh, deal with in the, in the time ahead. Uh, consideration has been given uh, at, at every stage to uh, how we would deal with that. Uh, in, in the past, sanctions didn't work. The, the only real sanction in terms of how we deal with uh, groups that are still committed to criminality and violence is the wall of the community, working with the government and working with the PSNI and the Gardaí in the south. But what we need to ensure is that the ultimate sanction is one that puts us in the driving seat as opposed to those who are still involved in these activities. And I do uh, have considerable confidence that the implementation of the strategy in relation to how we tackle paramilitarism and criminality can work through the collaborative approach. That's the ultimate sanction. Call Mr. Chris Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In a, a leaked version of the OFMDFM commissioned uh, investigating links in achievement and disadvantage study, uh, there were findings that continuing paramilitary influence in our uh, communities is having a corrosive impact and disadvantage on disadvantaged communities, creating negative role models uh, through people prospering outside of regular education. So, can I ask the Deputy First Minister why OFMDFM has sat on the publication of this report since approximately December 2015? And given the significance of these findings, when we can expect publication of this report? Well, I, I think that whenever we agreed to establish a three-person panel uh, for the purposes of uh, putting in place a, a strategy which would bear down on criminality within all areas, including areas of disadvantage, it was in the sure knowledge that the people who were on that group, and I, I, I do think they've done wonderful work, Lord Alderdice, uh, John McBurney and Monica McWilliams, clearly identified during the course of uh, their work the issues which the member has referred to uh, in the course of this uh, question time. So I think we are dealing with it, but we're dealing with it in a, in a much more uh, comprehensive fashion through trying to implement the findings of the three-person panel. Oh, Mr. Jim Mallist. Okay. What credibility has the executive in, purpo in purporting to promote the disbandment of paramilitary organisations in circumstances where the Deputy First Minister still denies the findings of last year's government panel that his IRA still has its structures, though reduced, and still is controlled by an army council. If half the government denies the existence of one of the primary paramilitary organisations of our day. What credibility is there in pretending there's a policy geared at disbandment? Worse still is the pretense that, that there is an IRA, when quite clearly the IRA have long since left the stage and handed over the responsibility for the politics of the North of Ireland to every single 108 members that uh, inhabits this House. I, I think we have loads of credibility. And our credibility was tested just a few short months ago at the election. Uh, along with the member's credibility, he returned himself. Yeah. I returned with 28 members, and, and the DUP with many more. I call Mr. Patsy McGlow. Colonel McGlow, I'll ask you to call you. The question number five. 
Uh, this uh, analysis paper was not sent to ministers or their special advisers. Following uh, a freedom of information request to the department, we came aware, became aware of this work and the document was released on two occasions following freedom of information request. Mr McGloan for a supplementary. Uh, could I ask the minister then which minister or junior minister or indeed special advisor was involved in authorising or instructing the civil servants that they carry out the report? Well, I, I don't know that that uh, question is, is even remotely relevant to the first question. No. Call Mr. Harold McKay. Speaker, could I ask why did the Deputy First Minister indicate he had sight of the paper when the First Minister claimed to have only become aware of the paper when the Freedom of Information request was received by the Department? Well, I, I don't think I, I ever claimed that I had sight of the paper. It, it, it was quite obvious in the answers that have been given uh, since that neither the First Minister and myself uh, were involved in seeing the outcome of this. Uh, the report was compiled by the European Policy and Coordination Unit, and officials prepare a range of papers on a regular basis, many of which are working papers, and do not form submissions sent to ministers. And of course, in the absence of an agreed position, the report could not have been disclosed to the Executive, the Committee for OFM, DFM, or the Assembly. And you see, the important point is this in regard to this particular subject, and it wasn't, some, it wasn't something that was rigidly adhered to in the context of the last administration, which was a five-party uh, coalition, because in that coalition there were countless occasions when at least two out of the three parties which did not take up seats in this executive were leaking right, left and centre. Now, that's not the way we do business. If, if, if a report is put forward for our consideration, then if we get into a scenario where we are leaking against one another because the outcome of that report advantages one particular political party, then all confidence is lost within the administration. I mean, this was a, this was a, a paper that wasn't even completed for the simple reason that a number of departments that have been requested to contribute uh, their analysis to the paper uh, hadn't actually done so. So we aren't talking about a, a completed document. Uh, we're talking about uh, a, a document that was uh, initially put forward by the, uh, the head of the civil service. So I think there's an awful lot of misinformation being uh, propagated about in relation to this document. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. The uh, Deputy First Minister has referred to the, the preliminary analysis report uh, being, uh, not being completed. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister uh, why was this report never completed? Well, it, it simply wasn't completed because, as I said, a number of uh, departments that have been uh, requested to contribute to it uh, didn't uh, respond to the request. Uh, and therefore, because they didn't respond, the document wasn't considered to be completed by the head of the civil service. Call Mrs. Michelle Gildernew. Uh, Ken Corla, and thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer so far. And he may have partially answered my supplementary, but I wonder can he elaborate on uh, why the report wasn't seen by ministers? Well, simply because, as I've said, the, the report was commissioned by the head of the civil service and was being compiled by the European Policy and Coordination Unit, but was never completed. Officials prepare a range of papers on a regular basis, many of which are working papers, and do not form submissions sent to ministers, and certainly never before they are completed. I call Mr Ford for a very quick question and a quick response. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A very quick question. Is the Deputy First Minister aware of the timescales for answering freedom of information requests and why there was such a delay in answering these particular requests? Well, I, th I think I referred to that issue earlier when I, the issue was addressed by Stephen Furry. Uh, and I do think that, uh, that in, in terms of the new administration, the fact that we are in place since May of this year, there is a, a duty and a responsibility to respond 
as quickly as possible. You shouldn't read anything into uh, the fact that the paper uh, was uh, produced as a result of the Freedom of Information request after the referendum date, because the key point is this. The key point is this. The key point is this, and that, and, and that as the member well knows, we had a situation in the run of the referendum where the two executive parties were on different sides of the debate. And therefore, well, the member can shake his head all he likes, but the rea that is the reality. And even if the document had been completed and offered up to the First Minister and myself, if there was no agreement about the publication of that document, then I wasn't going to leak it because it was to my advantage, even though it would have been to our advantage. Because that's the way we work. And I understand that there are other parties here who have seized on this issue, who were part of the administration, but who were, when they were part of the administration, were leaking right, left and centre. Members, that ends the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr Andy Allen. Mr Speaker, does the Deputy First Minister accept the assessment of the investigative journalist company The Detail that only around 55 per cent of the programme for government targets were achieved in the last mandate? Well, my understanding is that the, uh, the programme for government, uh, in terms of the uh, the success of it was something in the 80 odd percent. Well, Mr. Allen, for a supplementary. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his brief answer. Um, Mr. Our Deputy uh, First Minister, um, would you accept beyond percentages? Um, indeed, it was big ticket issues such as dealing with the past, uh, the long case and maze site, um, delivering a state of the art facility for emergency services, um, and the, deliver the provision of goods, facilities, and services um, that weren't achieved. Well, I mean, it's, it's common knowledge that there were a, n a number of issues uh, that uh, were, were not achieved during the course of the last administration for various reasons. He, the member mentions the situation at Mays Long Cash. His own party played uh, a leading role in scuttling that project because a key element of that project was the uh, removal of the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society from the King's Hall to uh, Maislong Cash, alongside the establishment of a peace building and conflict resolution centre, which was opposed by the members' party. They weren't the only party to oppose it, and uh, there, were other, there were other interest groups outside also who opposed it. So, well, you, you shouldn't speak while well, I'm speaking. I'm trying to finish the, 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 the answer. The, 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 the visit, for example, to uh, Brussels, which was led by the leader of the members' party, saw at least half the delegation who were people who voted to, uh, for Brexit. And, and I listened to the leader's uh, interview afterwards, where, where he outlined the need for huge funds to be poured into infrastructural projects. Yet, one infrastructural project that the Ulster Unionist Party had control over during the last administration, and which they had no intention of ever delivering, was the A5. Well, we're now going to deliver it. I call Mr Oliver McMullen. Minister, I, like many other people, have been increasingly concerned about the rise of racism both during and after the EU referendum. And the language emanating from the Tory party conference last week has not helped. Could the Deputy First Minister comment on the implications of the EU referendum result for people from other countries who come here to live and work amongst us? Well, I mean, the, the EU referendum result has unfortunately resulted in significant uncertainty and worry amongst migrant communities regarding their legal status, rights and entitlements, and has also heightened fears of racism and hate crime. And, and of course, there is a duty on all of us in politics to show positive leadership. Unfortunately, uh, I think that was absent at the recent Tory party conference, uh, ironically held in the part EU-funded Birmingham International Convention Centre. Well, Mr McMullen, for supplementary. Can I thank the, the Minister for his, for his answer? And could the Minister tell us what can we do 
to help and reassure migrant and foreign national communities that they are welcome here? Uh, with your permission, uh, Mr. Speaker, Junior Minister Fearham will answer this question. Uh, thank you. Um, I thank the member for his question. I do believe that there is an onus on all of us to um, show support to our minority ethnic communities and our migrant workers. Um, and I do believe that the majority of people in the North, as evidenced by the most recent Life and Time survey, want a welcoming society and want an outward-looking society and an open one, and one where people uh, feel a sense of belonging to this place. And I have to stress that there is absolutely no place for racism in our society at all. Um, people who have come to make their lives here must be protected. And just last week, Junior Minister Ross and I attended the launch of the No Hate Here campaign in North Belfast, which was a PCSP initiative. And I think that was an important example because we are very much working hand in hand with the Department for Justice in developing a dedicated action plan as part of the community safety strategy to tackle hate crime. Question number three has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, could I ask the Minister what, and I hope for an answer this time, uh, what is the involvement of the, of the UDA with Charter NI? Well, uh, I think we've extensively covered uh, that question uh, during the course of the uh, proceedings today. Uh, I'm disappointed that the member thinks that the question wasn't answered. But in my opinion, the question was answered adequately. Uh, we uh, put in place uh, a SIF program, which has been of immense benefit to people all over the north of Ireland. The Members' Party, from the very outset, was opposed to it, described it as a slush fund for paramilitaries, where, which I think does massive disservice to all the good people right throughout the north of Ireland who day and daily make a contribution towards making life better for the people in their communities. They have seized on this one issue in East Belfast. Uh, nobody is questioning the bona fides of uh, the Charter Group who are charged with taking forward that aspect of the SIF programme in uh, East Belfast. Nobody has questioned their bona fides whatsoever. They have seized on the name of one person who, who was, yes, in the past convicted. But that also raises the question uh, more widely. If, if we are to be in a scenario where people who were previously convicted of incidents that occurred during the course of the conflict and we were going to uh, effectively disbar them from contributing to society, then we would actually be running against the recommendations of the three-person panel, which dealt with that issue. And that issue was about reintegrating people into society. It was also about asking effectively that the First Minister and myself would write to the U.S. authorities so that people who were being denied visas could, live or, could, could visit the United States. So, you know, in, in many ways, this just represents a cheap point scoring exercise, mainly at the expense of the. Well, I don't, we, I don't think we give way during question time. At, at, at the expense, at the expense of local communities. Mr. McLaughlin, for a supplementary. I thank the minister for for that answer. Um, I don't regard it as cheap, and I would ask the minister if he's aware of allegations that people have been forced onto the streets through uh, or due to drug debts to the UDA. I have no doubt whatsoever that there are people uh, in paramilitary organisations who are involved in not just that type of activity, but I'm also conscious that there are uh, so-called dissident groups in West Belfast who are day, day and daily exhorting money from the uh, business community in that area, as they have done in, in other parts of the north of Ireland. It should come as no surprise to anybody, and it does not come as any surprise to me, that there are still people active in the UDA and dissident groups preying on society. The, the, the question really is, are the people who are involved in the implementation of the SIF programme in East Belfast doing so in a way that ensures that every single penny of that money goes towards the, uh, the cause uh, that, that they have taken up in that area by ensuring, in this instance, that something like, I think it's 300 people, are, are given work placements with a very real prospect of getting full-time jobs afterwards. Call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, could the Deputy First Minister um, give an update on the implications uh, of Brexit for the island of Ireland? 
uh, taking into account you're going into a uh, JMC meeting next week. Well, you know, I, I think that uh, it, it's, it's quite obvious that in the upcoming discussions, uh, we are going to make a case that uh, effectively uh, we are a special case, and that's identified by the fact that the First Minister and I have written jointly to the British Prime Minister outlining quite a number of areas concerned, including our concern around the prospect that there would be a border of, of any description. And I think it's also worth noting that uh, Geoffrey Donaldson last week on RTE uh, on two occasions uh, made it clear that, that he thinks that the island of Ireland does need to be treated as a special case. Uh, and he then repeated that, I think, in Brussels 24 hours later. So I, I do think that we are a special case. I do think that the, 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 the prospect of Brexit negotiations impacting on political, social and economic life of uh, the people of the North is so profound that we do have a duty to work together to ensure that the interests of the people that we represent are protected. And of course, the best way forward in this, hopefully, and I don't know if it's possible to do it, but I think the, the strongest hand that we will have to play in any negotiation would be if we can come to an agreement between ourselves and with the Irish government as to what they ask is from our perspective. So, we will get the first indication about where all of this is going whenever the First Minister and I attend the meeting of the Joint Ministerial Council, which will be chaired by the Prime Minister on Monday of next week. Mr Sheehan, for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his answer. And I wonder, could the Deputy First Minister give any indication as to whether any of our European partners are aware of the issues that are facing Ireland? Well, I, I think the member will know that I, I spent last Tuesday at uh, the European Parliament uh, engaged in 14 uh, meetings, including with some of the key negotiators on behalf of the European Parliament when the negotiations begin. Uh, I have to say it was a very hard line position towards the British government from almost everybody that I met. Uh, that doesn't mean to say it will be a hard line position when it comes to triggering Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. Now, all of us who have been through uh, negotiations in the past know how all of this works. So I think that at, at the moment, the important thing from our perspective is that there is an appreciation among the powers that be in Europe about the fantastic achievements that we've had here through peace and, and so forth, in which they've had a major uh, contribution. Uh, they are stakeholders also in our peace process through the uh, massive investments uh, in interreg programs, infrastructural projects, peace funds and so forth. Uh, and of course all of that has contributed along with all of the other initiatives to the transformation that has taken place over the course of the last now almost 20 years. So I think people in Europe are under no illusions whatsoever about the uh, the, the, the special nature of the problems that we have to deal with. Call Mr. Tom Buchanan. Can the Deputy First Minister give the House an update on the consultations on the programme for government? Yeah, well, uh, things are going very well. Uh, we have uh, been through the first phase of the consultation, and uh, I, I hear some sniggering from those who are totally at odds with where the vast bulk of our community is at. The stakeholders, the business community, educational establishments, the community and voluntary sector, farming organisations, all of whom appreciate the fact that not alone are they being consulted once, but being consulted twice, and, and will have the ability to have their say in the formation of the programme for government. In my opinion, it's going very, very well, and I think that's appears to be much to the annoyance of some people in the opposition parties. Mr Buchanan, for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his um, response. How will this encourage greater collaboration amongst the stakeholders and the small businesses, uh, and especially whenever we look at uh, West Tyrone, a rural constituency? 
Well, I would have been very surprised if West Tyrone hadn't been mentioned in that uh, supplementary question. But obviously, I mean, the collaborative approach is very, very important. And we have often said, uh, even against the backdrop of the phenomenal success that we've had at a time of world economic downturn, and we managed to bring more and more foreign direct investment, mainly from the United States of America, than at any other time in the history of the state. But what we have said is that the backbone of our economy is our own indigenous businesses, including in West Tyrone, and for Manus South Tyrone, Mid Ulster, all around the North. Absolutely appreciate the massive contribution that they have made, but they are very appreciative of the uh, consultative process, the outcomes-based process that we have engaged in, and I am sure that their voices will be heard loud and clear at the end of that. Members, time is up.